The Power of the Rosary is one of our most popular series. It's certainly a topic very dear to my heart. I've been preaching on the rosary since I began. In this series, I give a talk on the, the meaning of the rosary, what it is. Uh, to pray the rosary is to pray the gospel. Uh, the meditation on the mysteries, those are gospel events. Uh, the prayers, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, they come right out of the gospel. And so to pray the rosary is to pray the gospel. And the gospel, in essence, is Jesus Christ himself. So we pray the rosary, we pray the gospel, we're praying Jesus. We interiorize Jesus, we become who we are, the body of Christ, empowered to carry out his mission. And in this series, I pray with the people. We pray the, the joyful, the sorrowful, and the glorious mysteries. We do the meditations, and then we pray together. I'm sure that you'll love this series, The Power of the Rosary. The gospel is Jesus himself at the end forever. You and I will be in heaven or hell, period. Let's begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Turning to Mary, the mother of the Lord, and our mother asking for her intercession, together let's pray, Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee, and blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we're gathered today with a few of our friends to talk about the rosary. Uh, we're in... Houston, Texas, and this is one of my favorite topics, and so we wanted to uh, put this little series together for you, and I'm going to try in the short time we have to express to you how strongly I feel uh, about the rosary. Uh, at one time, I, the first time, I was on EWTN on Mother Angelica Live. Jeff Cavins was interviewing me. Mother was about to get on an airplane to fly to Spain. And at the end of the show, Jeff said, uh, Father, we have about five minutes left. If you could say just one thing to the many tens of thousands of people that will see this show, what would you say? That's one of those moments that Jesus spoke about, I think, when he said, don't worry about what you're to say. Your Father will give you the words. And... Um, I could have said a lot of good things. You know, I, I could have said, um, read the Bible every day. And that would be a great thing to do, the Word of God, so, so rich. I could have said, make a holy hour every day. Spend time with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. That is a tremendous thing to do, and I think it, it's really the answer to a lot of the world's problems, all of the world's problems, really. That's not what came out of my mouth, though. That's not what the Holy Spirit gave me at that point in time. I quite simply said, pray the rosary. Pray the rosary. If you could say one thing to your best friends and your relatives and those that you love and those that you care about, what would you say? I would say, just so you know what I would say, I would say pray the rosary. Now, I'm going to take the next several minutes uh, to try to tell you why. In very simple terms, I'll maybe start off with um, the way I've done it with some of my good Christian friends who uh, don't believe everything that we Catholics believe, but um, they're wonderful people. Nonetheless, good Christians, they, they, they're very faithful um, to their religion. I might be with a pastor friend of mine in the South a Southern Baptist. And I might say to him on a nice morning, how are you doing this morning, Pastor? And he'll say, oh, fine. I said, did you say your rosary yet today? And he will look at me with a very strange look, thinking I've lost my mind. You know we don't do that. We don't pray the rosary. I said, well, why not? What do you have against the gospel? Now, you don't want to say that to a good 
Baptists because they love the gospel, and rightly so. They love the Word of God. Why is the rosary so powerful? It's the prayer of the gospel. I'm going to get right to the point real fast. It's the prayer of the Holy Gospel. And one might say, well, I don't see that. How, how can that be? And then you begin to explain it. The, the rosary is the prayer of predilection of the Blessed Mother. Now, it is true that there are also people who struggle with the Blessed Mother. Now, I don't have time this afternoon to give a long teaching in Mariology, although I could. I'll just sum it up for you. I'll just sum it up, synthesize it, and distill it for you. Ready? If she's good enough for Jesus, she's good enough for you. And it's that simple. The mother of God. Is Jesus God? Yeah. Well, absolutely. Jesus is Lord. He's a divine person. No question about that. Is she his mother? Yes. Well, how can we say she's the mother of God? By the way, that's a theological assertion in the Catholic Church. That's part of the doctrine of the faith. Is she the mother of God? Yes, without any question. We even celebrate that solemnity on January 1st. She's the mother of God. Jesus is a divine person. Mary said yes to God through her fiat. What happened? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now that word, that subject of action is divine. He assumed that human nature through the fiat, the yes, of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so she is his mother, mother of the Lord, mother of God, and our mother. Jesus gave her to us from the cross. You remember when it happened, when Jesus was on the cross? And he turned to the beloved disciple, right, John, and he said, behold your mother. And then, turning to his mother, he said, Woman, that, note that word. He, uh, Jesus uses that mysterious words, uh, word a couple of times, woman. Woman, behold your son. There's a very universal thing taking place at this point. Behold your son. Behold your mother. Jesus called her woman, denoting a universality. You remember who the first woman was Eve, right, in the book of Genesis. She is called Eve, the mother of all the living. That's what her name means, mother of all the living. That's Eve. But Eve, through her prideful disobedience, became the mother of all the dead and dying. Original sin. And so theologians tell us, some of the fathers of the church, that in the fullness of time, and this is scripture, Galatians 4.4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to deliver from the law those who were subject to it. Galatians 4.4. 4. That's Mary. That's Mary, the woman who brought forth that son, who is the son of God, and also her son, the son of justice. Mary is very important. She is not just a casual bystander in the history of salvation. She is the one who said yes to God, and then God became flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So this prayer of the rosary, we, we often think of it related to the Blessed Mother, uh, and it is, but I want to try to get you to think of it in a very biblical way, because it is. I'm going to show you that the rosary is the prayer of the Holy Gospels. Now, the rosary is an interesting uh, prayer. It's the most highly indulgenced personal prayer in the history of the church. Um, several popes uh, have imparted indulgences uh, to the rosary. And in, by the way, an indulgence is not a bad thing. An indulgence is a good thing. Uh, from the storehouse of the treasury of the church. The church has the ability, the authority, under the power of the keys, to give grace big, out of this storehouse. Uh, that sto where does the storehouse of grace come from? Well, the, from the absolutely infinite merits 
of Jesus Christ, his passion, death, and resurrection, number one, uh, from the merits of the Blessed Mother, uh, who is in Christ. She's his mother. She's not apart from him. She's in there. How about us? How about the saints? Uh, is it possible for us to merit? Yes, but never apart from Christ, only in Christ. How, do you, how are you in Christ? You get baptized. Once you're baptized, you're taken up into Christ. And so it is at that point that we can merit grace, but only in Jesus, never apart from him. Okay. So out of that storehouse of grace, the church uh, can bestow indulgences. They're gifts. The rosary is the most highly indulgent personal and private prayer, aside from liturgical prayer. It has a body and a soul. I bet you didn't know that. Most of you didn't know that the rosary has a body and a soul. You know, we have a body and a soul, right? We know that, that a, a human being has a body and a soul. Do you know what the soul is uh, in philosophical terms? Maybe some of you have studied a little philosophy. Uh, the soul is, as we say, the form of the body. The soul is that which gives life to the body, the animating force of the body. The soul of the rosary is the meditation on the 15 mysteries, okay? That's the soul. What gives life to the rosary, the soul of the rosary, the meditation on the 15 mysteries. And then someone who's not familiar with it might say, but, well, well what's that? Mysteries. What, what are these 15 mysteries? And then we can go through and show them. Uh, I could say, well, the first mystery, the first joyful mystery, which we will pray together a little while later, is the Annunciation. And someone, Annunciation, well, what's that? Where's that come from? And then you and I could show them in the Gospel of Luke, first chapter, right? When the angel Gabriel came to a virgin of Nazareth, betrothed to a man named Joseph, and the virgin's name was Mary. And then you remember the Annunciation, right? When the angel Gabriel announced the Incarnation, announced that she would bear a son, and she, she was, how can this be? Uh, I'm not married. I have no relations with a husband. How can this be? The power of the Most High will come upon you, and so forth. That's the Annunciation. First chapter, Gospel of Luke. So if someone says, well, what are these mysteries? Where do you dream those up? We didn't dream them up. They're events right out of Scripture. First one, Annunciation. Second one, Visitation. Well, where does the Visitation come from? Well, you look right in the Gospel of Luke, and you see that the Blessed Mother arose and went in haste to the hill country of Judah, and so forth. See her cousin Elizabeth, who was already six months with child. John the Baptist was her son and so forth. The nativity, Christmas, right? presentation in the temple, finding in the temple, where do those things come from? Right out of the gospel. And so do we do, and the meditations on the mysteries, what we're basically doing is we're considering these gospel events all the way through. If you consider the 15 uh, mysteries of the Holy Rosary, what do you have? You have a synthesis of the gospel from beginning to end, from all the way from the Annunciation to the Passion, Death, and Resurrection and Ascension of Christ, and then the last two can be deduced from Scripture, right? The Assumption of Our Lady into Heaven, Body, and Soul, and the Coronation of Our Blessed Mother, Queen of Heaven and Earth. That constitutes a distillation a synthesis, condensation of the gospel. Now, somebody who's even more basic in their understanding, maybe they're not Christian at all, maybe they don't know anything about this. I, I actually, I have had Buddhists, I have had Hindus, uh, I have had Muslims, you know, Islamic people, that have entered the Catholic Church as a result of very, very simply stating these truths. Something happened. I don't talk them into anything, by the way. Very often people will say, oh, Father, you're an apologist. You, you defend the faith. No, I don't. I really don't. That's, people are mistaken to think that. I do not do that. I 
have never talked anybody into anything or out of anything in my whole life. I just don't know how to do it. I'm not that clever. Now, God can do it. Now, he can use me to present a fact here or a fact there, but grace moves uh, through the truth. So, we have the rosary like us, body and a soul. The soul of the rosary, that which gives life to it, the animating force, the meditation on the mysteries, the substance of which is the gospel. Right? Now, if you are one of those people who really don't understand Christianity, you'll say, gospel? Well, what is the gospel? Now, words are very important. We have a tremendous attack on the church and on society today, and one of the weapons the enemy uses, words. Words. Uh, the misapplication of words, the misunderstanding of words, the misconstrual of words. Words are very important. How important are words? Words are so important that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's very important. What does it mean to be a word? When we say Jesus is the word of God, he is the eternal word. Uh, this is a very theological uh, statement. Uh, Jesus is the Father's only word. In the eternal silences of the Trinity, God our Father spoke but one word, Jesus, his only Son. So you see, the word of God is the self-expression in the power of the Spirit of our Heavenly Father. Words are very, very, very important. In considering the power of the rosary, you look at the mysteries and you see it's the gospel. And you ask, what is the gospel? And I tell you, the word means good news. Okay? We know that. The word gospel means good news. And then the next logical question would be, well, what's that? You say, oh, the good news. What is the good news? Okay? Is the good news something? No. no. You have to learn how to think these things. Very simple. Very simple. The good news is not merely something. The good news is somebody. Jesus is the good news. The summation of the gospel is Jesus Christ. The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself. Not a mere something. A divine somebody. Jesus. That's the gospel. That's the good news. So what are we praying when we pray the rosary? We're praying the gospel, the good news. We're praying Jesus we begin to interiorize them, and we become who we are, the body of Christ. Now, this is a very, very simple thing, not rocket science. It's very simple, but it's very profound. And sad to say, a great many pseudo-sophisticated people will never get it. They will never get it because they are too blinded by their own pride. Uh, they think it's too simple. They would call it simplistic. It is simple. But you have to remember, if you know theology, you know God, by definition, is pure simplicity. Not to us. We can't. We, we have a finite mind. And a finite mind cannot completely encompass the infinite. And so, yes, we struggle. We struggle with it. We, we, we just can't get it all. But God, by definition, is pure simplicity. And the things of God are quite simple. Uh, little children can understand the things of God. And Jesus said, it is of such as these, meaning the children, that the kingdom of heaven is comprised. And you must become, if you would enter the kingdom of heaven, you must become like little children. Now, what does that mean? Uh, that means that you have to be simple. You have to be... Uh, let me tell you one of the most frightening things about being sophisticated and or educated. Now, education is a great thing. Um, I have education. I have some education. I have more education than most people. By the grace of God, I have five university degrees. That's a, a lot of education. But I can tell you one of the most frightening things about education is that if you're not careful, very quickly you can begin to think you know something. And you really don't. 
we can begin to think we're, as my grandmother used to say, too big for riches. You know, we begin to think, hey, look how smart I am. See how much I know. See how many degrees I have. See all those initials after my name indicating how smart I am. Listen, it's entirely possible to be educated into imbecility. Make no mistake about it. You can be educated right out of common sense, and it happens every day. And one of the worst occupational hazards of educated people, and that includes priests, theologians, teachers, doctors, lawyers, those are wonderful professions. And that education is a great and noble thing. But one of the occupational hazards is that we can be so blinded by our own light that we begin to think we're the source of our own glory. I just gave a definition of Lucifer, the fallen angel, the brightest of the angels. That very word means light of the morning or morning star. One of the most intelligent of the angels. Problem was he knew it. And he was blinded by that. It's called arrogance. And he began to think he was smarter than God. Uh, do you understand that today a lot of people think they're smarter than God? Even in the church, we run into it. There are people who think they're smarter than the Holy Father, that they know more than the collected wisdom passed down to us through the ages. Uh, they reject the teaching in the catechism and so forth. Uh, this is not education. Authentic education is a journey into the truth. That's a simple definition, but a true one. Authentic education will lead you more deeply into the truth, not away from it. Very often, this occupational hazard of arrogance will result in people saying, Oh, rosary. Ah, oh, I don't do that. That bores me. That's an, an old lady's prayer. I like it when they say that. Believe me, heaven is paved with such, quote, old ladies. Uh, they have prayed for me for many years, and probably just about any good that I will ever do will be, be because of their help. And so don't discount the power of such simple, simple prayer. Well, then they, they might say, okay, you talk about the soul of the rosary, uh, the meditation on the mysteries, gospel prayer, but what about the prayers? You know, you Catholics, you say those prayers over and over and over again. Let's face it, you know, the rosary... The body of the rosary, we talk about the soul of the rosary, the meditation on the mysteries. The body or corpus of the rosary is the prayers, the Our Father and the Hail Mary, uh, primarily, right? Uh, five decades, most of us say, but there's 15 in the whole rosary. But um, we separate into, into three um, divisions of five decades each. You know, joyful mysteries, we call it, sorrowful mysteries, glorious mysteries. And the main prayers are the Our Father and the Hail Mary. And once again, a little common sense goes a long way. And people that uh, resist this so much, I say, well, what's so bad about it? Well, we talked about the mystery. What about the prayers? What do you got against the Lord's Prayer? Nobody can argue with that, right? The Our Father, everybody accepts that, all Christians except the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer. Well, one might say, you know, let's say we're talking to a Buddhist. Well, where does that come from? Where does that Our, our Father who art in heaven, where, where did you get that? Out of the Gospel. Right? We get that right out of the Gospel. They said to Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he said, when you pray, you are to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and so forth. So you see, the, the Our Father is Gospel prayer. Once again, gospel, good news, good news, Jesus. Yeah, but what about that Hail Mary? The doubters may say, I'm glad you asked. What about the Hail Mary? Well, where'd you get that? Right out of the gospel. I already mentioned it, right? First chapter, gospel of Luke. The angel Gabriel comes. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Right? Gospel prayer. And then Blessed Mother goes to her cousin Elizabeth. Blessed are you among women, Elizabeth says. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Where'd that come from? Right out of the gospel, word for word. Gospel prayer. 
Okay? And who could, who could argue with the glory be that we say at the end of the decades, right? Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. That's a Trinitarian praise, worship of the Trinity. That's basic theology. Everybody, all Christians, anyway, we, we believe that there's one God, three divine persons. Certainly Catholics believe it, and most Protestants do too. That's the rosary. The prayers, the body. The meditation on the mystery, the soul. That's the whole rosary. And that is the way we should think of the rosary. It's the prayer of the Holy Gospel. And what I've given you first here is the reason it's powerful. Okay? I, I've given you here the reason that the rosary is powerful. But you may say, yeah, but I don't like it. So? I don't, it doesn't matter if you like it or not. You want results? Do it. You know, it's like the Nike commercial. You ever see it? They, they say, just do it. You know, anybody who's ever tried to exercise, right, jogging or whatever you do, it's hard at first, isn't it? Why is it hard? You have to overcome inertia. That's not so easy, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, <laughs> the law of inertia. You know, stationary bodies tend to stay stationary. It takes a certain effort to move them. And so that initial effort is difficult. Uh, exercise, hey, the first time you do it is the hardest. The second time, it's a tiny bit easier. After two, three weeks, you look forward to it. And if you miss, you really miss it. You're so, you you want to get back to it. You, it does something for you. It energizes you. It invigorates you. Prayer is like that. In the beginning, it may seem, oh, no, it's like an obstacle. I remember when I was a little boy, growing up in a good Catholic family, we would go to visit now and then my great-grandfather. Um, most of my family was Italian, but on my mother's side, uh, my mother's uh, father, my maternal grandfather, uh, was French-Canadian. And we would go up to visit my great-grandparents, and my great-grandfather was a carpenter. And he had carved the beautiful statues of the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph, and he had a, a, a niche in his wall where, where he had, uh, had them in there and he he was a very short man and but he was about he was about as wide as he was short at the shoulders he was a very powerful man but not very tall and great grandfather every evening after supper would lead the family in the prayer of the rosary all the children all the grandchildren all the anybody else who was around and when great grandfather announced that we were now praying the rosary, it was not even conceivable that someone would have a protest. And he would kneel down right in front of the uh, statues of St. Joseph and our Blessed Mother. He would kneel down with his rosary and he would begin to pray. He would lead his family in prayer. Now, there were times that we children, we didn't want to do that. It was not our favorite fun thing to do. We wanted to go out and play with our cousins or whatever, but I'll guarantee you we did it. And the parents were not so lax or permissive as to let us get away with it. It only took 15, 20 minutes. And they knew that that was 15 or 20 minutes well spent. There was a movement back then called the Family uh, Rosary Crusade. Many of you... Uh, were alive then, you remember Father Peyton. If you don't remember that, I'll guarantee you, you remember his saying, the family that prays together stays together. Right? That, that part has come down to us. Even if you forgot or never knew who Father Peyton was or the family rosary crusade, you've heard that. I'll tell you what, it was true 50 years ago, and it's true today. And it is common sense. Uh, I just saw a news bulletin a week or so ago, and they say that they have done research now, and the government has linked um, the time that you spend with your children, or don't spend with your children, to drug problems or criminal activity. In other words, the more time you spend with your children, having dinner with them, the less likely they are to get in, involved with drugs, gangs, 
and that kind of thing. Uh, the government came up with the study. They did research, and it, it's common sense to me. You know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to conclude that. Years ago, it was normal. Families ate their meals together, uh, and a great number of them prayed together. Uh, religious uh, lived together in community. They prayed together. They had their meals together. Uh, they suffered together very often. You know, uh, being a religious and being a married person, these are very similar things. These are states in life that God has given to us for the purpose of sanctifying us, um, to make us holy. In other words, most people are called to the married state. It's true that most people end up getting married. That, that is the most common state in life. So it probably is the most important. God has a lot more married people than he does priests or religious, but they're all important. But married people know that it isn't easy. Oh, sure, in the beginning, everything is beautiful. You're uh, the honeymoon and the afterglow of the honeymoon, and it's just wonderful. But then after a year or two, reality sets in. You've got to live with the guy, you know, or the woman. And, and then it is not, you can't run on emotion then. There better be more than mere feelings at that point. Love is a decision. Love is an act of the will. You will not be able to do it day in and day out without the help of prayer. The family that prays together stays together. Uh, I can give an example. When I was a novice, my novice master, uh, now being a religious um, or priest or seminarian, you have to live close with other people, like in a family, right? In a family, you're, you're in the same house with your husband or your wife or your children, parents, so forth. Uh, in a religious community, the sisters or brothers, uh, monks, they live close. They live in community. And I remember when I was a novice, I, I used to, uh, they're all different personalities in a family and in a religious house. And sometimes uh, somebody's personality will drive you absolutely crazy. They're just, you know, I remember my novice master saying, oh, there are some people that are, that are in, um, in religious houses, just like in families, that it seems that the only function they have in life is to make saints out of others. <laughs> and you think about that, well, that's one of the reasons it's sanctifying. It exercises us in virtue. But you have to have the grace to exercise virtue. And the grace, if you don't pray, you're not going to have it. I'll give you an, an analogy. And this holds true in families or in religious life, in seminaries, any place. Any place where interpersonal relations are there. And they're there everywhere in society. Do you know how they polish gemstones? Uh, some of the ladies their uh, wedding rings, their engagement rings with diamonds, or you might have a ring with an emerald or a ruby in it. And uh, you know how they get them to be beautiful like that, to shine them, the, the normal method? They'll take the precious gems and they'll put them in a tumbler with grit, right, an abrasive material, right? And they put it, and the tumbler goes round and round, and the grit rubs off the um, rough edges and it, and it smooths them and cleans them and they shine after a while and they're made beautiful that's life in the monastery or the religious house or the family we're in there with a lot of grit sometimes and every one of us has been grit to somebody else at one time or another and so we rub the rough edges off of each other now in order to do that in order to persevere in order to be able to do it in love, you have to pray. You really need the strength afforded by prayer. And today, oh, the temptations and the struggles today, you have to pray. And most people are not going to pray unless they have a set way in a, to pray. You can pray any way you like. You've talked from your heart to God, pray spontaneously. You know, you can pray from a prayer book. 
But the, what I'm talking about, the prayer of the rosary is easy. Children do it. You know, I'd start doing it when I was six, seven years old. Anybody can do it. But it's a powerful prayer. And you know what? It's in a form that is easy. It's easy. Once you overcome inertia, and there's great power. Now, that will begin to bring down graces. When they ask me, give one piece of advice, Father, I said, pray the rosary. It brings graces to do all the other things we ought to do. When I was about 16 and headed down the wrong path, my mother, who had prayed for me day in and day out, uh, also had preached to me, uh, as mothers have to do to their children. At the time. But after I got a certain age, I don't know, 18 maybe, probably 18, knowing my mother, uh, it was after I was out of the house. But if, as long as I was there, she continued her preaching career. Uh, she terminated her preaching career uh, when I was in my late teens because she saw that it was like talking to a wall. It did no good. But my mother did not give up on me. For 20 years, my mother prayed the rosary for me every day. Day in and day out. And my mother had to witness some terrible things. Uh, she had to see her firstborn son go from bad to worse. She could see it coming. You know how it is, moms or dads. You can see it coming. They're going down the wrong road, and you know trouble is right there. You know they're starting to maybe drink and go to parties, and who knows if there's drugs there nowadays or whatever it is. You're staying out later and later at night, and you're worried. More and more and more. And I'll give you a little example. A few years ago, a, um, a good mother came up to me at a conference and she said, Father, please talk to my son. And mothers are always telling me that because they know my story. You know? And I said, well, I don't normally do that because I, I just were right. Oh, please. She was like that lady in the, in, the, uh, in the gospel with the unjust judge. Remember, she wore him out. <laughs> he finally gave her what she needed. Uh, and this lady was kind of like that. She had a very compelling, insistent personality. I said, finally, okay, uh, does he want us to talk to me? Well, no. <laughs> but she kept it up. So finally, the next day, she brought him to the rectory. And he came in, and she left. And I said, son, how can I help you? He said, you can't help me. And I said, well, what can I do for you? You can't do a thing for me. And it went downhill from there. Finally, in exasperation, I said, look, I'll just pray for you. And he scoffed. He laughed. He said, what are you going to pray for? I said, well, I'm just going to pray God kicks your butt. <laughs> now, I'm making this point because sometimes parents become exasperated or frightened or even panicked about their children. Well, about a week later, the telephone rang, and it was mom, his mom, and she was very upset. Oh, father, a terrible thing has happened. My son has been in a terrible car accident. He's in the hospital. And I remember thinking the profound thought, yes. <laughs> terrible thing to think. But I knew what I was talking about because I knew I had prayed, and I knew God had answered the prayer. Sometimes that's the answer to a prayer. Well... My mother prayed 20 years, and my world fell apart in due time. Uh, I wouldn't wish it on anybody, honestly, but I would wish the results on everybody. Uh, the results were conversion of heart. Now, I have no merit whatsoever um, in my own life. I know that. I'm not responsible for uh, my own conversion. Uh, but I know that my mother and my grandmother, uh, they prayed the rosary, and they had an enormous amount of grace at work because of their prayer of the rosary. Oh, I went right to the edge. I could have been killed many, many times, many times. Uh, I was in situations where I could have died. And I, one time I, I was living uh, in Los Angeles, and I had a a weekend date with a rather well-known actress and we got in my Ferrari and drove across the desert Friday evening to go to Las Vegas and I at one point I was going about 150 miles an hour 
And the highway patrol came after me. I didn't know they were back there because they were way back there. But they set up a roadblock and stopped me. And we were extremely nervous because in the trunk there was something that shouldn't have been there, a briefcase full of cocaine, which could have sent me to prison for a very long time. A whole entourage of highway patrol officers. I'm very good friends with a lot of California highway patrol guys these days. But back then, I was not very smart. Well, the officer in charge said, step out of the car, please. And, uh, you know, it was one of those moments when you know you're in big trouble. And uh, he said, open the hood, please. And, of course, the only thing I'm thinking is open the trunk, right, which would have sent me to prison. Open the hood. And luckily, it did register, so I, I opened the hood. And about eight or nine highway patrol officers gathered around the engine compartment of that Ferrari, Ferrari and they were peering in, asking questions. Well, is it uh, fuel injected or carburetors? How many horsepower does it have? And so forth and so on. And I'm beginning to say, no, this couldn't be. <laughs> Finally, they said, now look, you got to be careful. You can't drive that fast. It's not safe. I said, yes, officer, I, I'll never do that again. And I got in there and went up. Now, that was not a coincidence. Uh, this is like a big net, and my mother had it around me. <laughs> right? You know, I, I, I was safe because I was protected by those prayers, powerful prayers, the prayer of the Holy Rosary. And so did many, many times. Uh, I have incorporated everything, my ministry, my own life, the salvation of the souls of those I love, those who I've never even met. I bring in the prayer of the rosary, and I have total confidence that that prayer can't fail. Why? Because it's the prayer of the gospel. And the gospel is the good news, and the good news is Jesus. And that's why it is powerful, very powerful. Now. I've given you some of the theology behind it, as it's the prayer of the rosary and so forth, and my personal experience to go with the theology, I'll tell you something. Powerful. Absolutely powerful. I have had, oh, I, I, I don't use the word miracle lightly. Sometimes that word is overdone. Uh, I've had some amazing things happen, though because of the prayer of the rosary, impossible situations. Uh, people who were on the edge of disaster. I remember working with someone in my family that I love very much who was um, addicted to alcohol. Now, I don't know how many of you have been through that, but um, uh, alcohol is one of the most dangerous um, addictive substances there, there is. And, and it's all the more dangerous because it's legal, right? You can get it anywhere. You can get it uh, in any grocery store. In California, you, you don't need a, a license. You know, like in New York, you've got to have a special liquor license and so forth. You can buy it in any grocery store or 7-Eleven uh, in California. You, it's right there. People can get addicted to it. It is a substance that lends itself to addiction. It can control you. I know for a fact that there, at times, can be demonic forces that attach to that. I could, I could talk a long time about this. I gave a course, series of talks in July, last July, on spiritual warfare, and I told people the principles behind it. You know how in the church, how we bless things like holy water? You know how that is? That they're called sacramentals. You take, hold it, you take water, say a certain blessing over it. Salt, say a certain blessing out of the Roman ritual we used to do. Wherever you sprinkle that water, then that prayer is placed. Now, by the way, in the old Roman ritual, that was an exorcism prayer. The salt, same thing. Oil, same thing. It was an exorcism prayer attached to that. And, and so you had a protection of that sacramental. Do you know, I'll give you an example. Remember the great Archbishop Fulton Sheen? One time, uh, like I'm just about ready to face another Lent 
and I always take a deep breath when Lent is upon me because I, I'm gone, I have to go constantly, one mission after the next. I go from one to the next to the next, right until May. Between now and May, it's nothing but traveling on and off airplanes, suitcase for my home and so forth. So I have to take a deep breath. The older I get and the more of these I do, I know, oh boy, here comes Lent. Uh, I'll see daylight around May. Bishop Sheen was on an airplane. He was going to preach. And it was Lent. And he, they, um, in those days, the stewardess, nowadays the flight attendant, brought the, uh, the lunch. And Bishop Sheen said, well, you know, I, I think I won't take lunch today since it's, um, it is Lent. And I should um, fast a little bit, you know, so no thank you. And there was a very attractive young lady sitting next to him. And she said, yeah, I won't take lunch either. And Bishop Sheen kind of perked up and he said, oh, uh, you're Catholic too? Fasting for Lent. And she said, oh, no. She said, I'm a witch and I'm fasting for abortions. And then she went on to explain to him the reverse side of the sacramental principle. How they can do things just like we do to bring evil into the world. When I was on the wrong side of the track, so to speak, um, I came in contact with some people in the music industry, uh, and there's a lot of drugs around that in Hollywood. Uh, I came in contact with an, a man who had fled Iran when the um, Shah of Iran was deposed. And this man came, he was one of the biggest drug dealer in Hollywood. And I, I knew some of those characters in those days, sad to say. Well, this man uh, was in contact with these major drug traffickers, several of them, several of them were satanic priests and involved with witchcraft. And what they would do is they would take a huge shipment, kilos of cocaine, and then they would bring in this satanic priest to offer satanic mass, black mass, and curse the cocaine. The reverse of the sacramental principle. We take holy water, bless salt, they would take that, and they would say various incantations and say, I don't want to call them prayers, but, you know, the equivalent from the other side. And those curses would attach to that material. Now, let me tell you something. The, all the people who are doing illegal drugs are not in a state of grace. And you've got to be in a state of grace to be protected from evil like that. And if, if, if you want to have a motivation, if you, you're, if you can't motivate yourself to stay out of serious sin uh, because of love, stay out of serious sin because of that. Because once you leave a state of grace and you're living in mortal sin, those things, then this is very real. It's not an old wives' tale or superstition. These curses and hexes and so forth, they're real. And you will begin to suffer like you can. Do you know that mental institutions are filled with people who have been afflicted because of this? Alcohol can be used as a medium for transferring such things, drugs, other things too. The rosary is a powerful weapon against evil. Padre Pio, blessed Padre Pio, very often, he would exclaim, bring me my weapon, bring me my weapon. And, uh, you know, he wasn't talking about an M16. And the brothers would say, your weapon, come on, you're a Franciscan. Why, you can't have a weapon. He says, oh, yeah, bring me my weapon. Bring me my, bring me my rosary right now. He understood that one of the greatest weapons to do battle against evil is the rosary. Why? Prayer of the Gospel, prayer of predilection of the Blessed Mother, who is the woman, right? Remember that word, woman? Jesus said, "Be woman, behold your son. In the first book of the Bible, we've got that woman who 
crushes the head of the serpent? That's a figure of the Blessed Mother. In the last book of the Bible, Revelation, chapter 12, we've got that woman, woman, clothed with the sun. And so, you see, you have enmity, you have a battle from beginning to end. From Genesis to Revelation, the Word of God talks about combat, talks about battle. And the woman is right in the thick of it. In other words, I could synthesize this part of the talk. And I, as some people like labels or titles. They, when, I, when I travel and go, they say they want the titles of what I'm going to talk on. I'll, usually I don't give them because I don't know because the Holy Spirit hasn't let me know yet. So they want a title. But if you like to have a title on this part of the talk, it's this. Your mama wears combat boots. <laughs> That's right. She does. Our mother, the blessed mother, is a warrior. And she does battle against the enemy. Now, this is real. You've seen the uh, statues of the blessed mother with the snake under the serpent, right? It indicating the devil, you know, the serpent. Well, this is real. Look, the rosary is so powerful. It is a great, great prayer. It's my experience. Uh, it's theological, but it is my personal experience as well. I have only been preaching for seven going on eight years. I have, by the grace of God, reached millions and millions of people already. Why? If you ask me, I don't, you know, I'm not God, I can't know for sure, but other than God's plan and God's grace, if you ask me, well, how can you get that much done that fast? That's what I'm telling you. That's what I'm telling you. If you will do this, you will have a protection. I'm not saying you'll be invincible. You still fight. You're still going to have the same battles that anybody will have, but you're going to have the strength to carry on. You've got a powerful, powerful ally in the mother of God. You've got a powerful, powerful weapon in the rosary, the most holy rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the prayer of the gospel. God bless.